Hello, I'm Oliver Gao. I'm the director of Cornell Systems and Engineering Program. And I have been uh, doing these system conversations with our uh, prestigious uh, speakers that we bring to campus to give, our, uh, to give a talk in our Ezra System Seminar Series. Today, I'm very delighted to introduce to you Dr. Gonzalo Pedro. And he is actually a, a master planning and a building performance consultant with RWDI in Toronto, Canada. He actually he got an aerospace engineering degree from the University Technical de Lisbo, which is IST, and has received a master's and a PhD degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. I just, you know, he, he actually has a long list of very outstanding work. He, I just want to cite one thing. I think Dr. Pedro is currently working with Sidewalk Labs and uh, the Waterfront Toronto to design and create outdoor uh, comfort guidelines for the Toronto Portland, which I believe is the largest water, waterfront uh, development project in North America. So I think there are definitely a lot of things for us to talk about. So I'll stop here and I would like to kind of uh, ask Dr. Pedro to continue our conversation to talk about himself, you know, his outstanding career path and, uh, you know, the way he has been dealing with all these complicated system challenges. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Pedro. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, I think after I, I finished my PhD, I actually mm -hmm. joined at the University of Victoria. I did a postdoc with the Integrated Energy Systems uh, oh. a group at, at, at the University of Victoria. And that's where I actually started to understand this very interesting potential for computational systems to really affect and, and, and help design systems. Uh, in that case, it was, was I was looking at hydrogen release from, uh, from hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Oh. Um, yeah, so another, another thing. So then I joined Vestas, which is a wind turbine manufacturer, and again, leveraging CFD mm -hmm. to computational fluid dynamics to understand how we site turbines. And in this case, it started introducing me into these in, the, the whole world of environmental flows uh, and, and sort of simulation of these outdoor external flows, but with that very strong linkage uh, to, to energy, in, mm -hmm. in essence. Um, push forward a few years, I joined RWDI, and it really opened up my eyes as to the kind of work that we can do where we apply these computational platforms to something as complex as a city or even building. So in cities, uh, even non-existent cities that we're designing uh, from scratch, mm -hmm. they're extremely complex beasts. So the whole master plan design process, um, you know, the master planner sits down and starts sketching the, the cities mm -hmm. based on some fundamental parameters. Uh, so what does the city have to look like? Um, what does it have to have in terms of types of buildings, uh, how many people are going to be there, the grid, and so forth. And it started, we started thinking about how can we des help design, right from the beginning, mm -hmm. a city that responds to climate, but also hits whatever metric we want to. So it sort of ends up being a twofold uh, advantage because, for one, you are um, uh, mitigating risk. So we have these hugely expensive, complex buildings, cities, what have you. So right from the beginning, by leveraging these, these tools, you're, you mis you're mitigating that risk. Um, but at the same time, uh, you're also measuring and, and predicting, and you're creating these metrics. So what that means is that we now have an objective. And we can as best we can, obviously, within the time frame of the project and, and, and budget, we can try to make sure that this design a achieves those goals, at least from a design perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's really what started fascinating me about this, this intersection of climate and design and, and computational tools. Well, it sounds like, you know, after you started with RWDI, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, the, the scale and also the scope of the work. Yes kind of simply exploded yes right so kind of yeah. to the city scale you know when you talk about cities of course uh you know now we have more than half of the population living in cities yes. and uh, especially the dimensions that you concerned about you know climate sensibility that has so much to do 
with the city planning and the design. I really appreciate, I think you mentioned earlier, that how can we plan and design like new cities from the scratch and mm -hmm. do the things right yes. from the very beginning. Yes. So speaking of this, what do, do you view as the fundamental trends mm -hmm. in the development of cities or our human communities mm -hmm. that are either presenting challenges or presenting opportunities mm -hmm. uh, for cities? What are the major driving factors underneath this urbanization and what are those, those, those trends and how can we either mitigate or make good use of those trends? Um, well, I think, as you mentioned, we're seeing a huge urbanization of, of the population, mm -hmm. world population. And with that, I mean, even in Toronto, what we're seeing is a densification of the downtown. With that comes a significant amount of challenges. Um, the infrastructure that we counted on before, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea of I could take my car and go from point A to point B in a certain amount of time, uh, not only has that amount of time increased significantly, but it is no longer reliable, which is maybe the worst thing. <laughs> um, so I think for me, what the one of the biggest challenges that exists in city building is changing the perceptions and attitudes of people within those cities. Uh, and so what that means is that as a designer, uh, a master planner has to create a design that is attractive enough, just from an operational perspective and even aesthetics and so forth, but that someone looks at and says, I have to change my ways, potentially, but it means I can live in this amazing place. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the biggest challenges that we have is getting people out of their cars and into public transportation uh, or potentially using a, a different kind of mode of transportation, like a bike mm -hmm. or even walking. Uh, but then what that means is that the way you design the city has to be a bit different. Your priorities have to shift a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're no longer, uh, and that actually can be a huge benefit. It's not only a challenge, but it can, can hugely beneficial. Think about uh, in essence, if you removed from certain streets all the cars, what would happen to those streetscapes? And right now in Toronto, we have uh, the King Street uh, pilot project where King Street is, is one of the major arteries in Toronto. And it is it has streetcars. And the streetcars essentially block traffic because they're sort of going down King Street. Mm -hmm. And so this city hall basically said, well, we're going to block King Street, a section of King Street off to 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 uh, to to traffic, cars can still go, but they they can only go on block before they they have to turn right. <laughs> so, but what's staggering is that when they did that, how the perception of how wide that street all of a sudden was, it, it looked almost desolate. Mm -hmm. And the reason was that all that traffic, all that activity, now was replaced by a few street cars, some cyclists, and some pedestrians. But what started happening was very interesting is that they also started allowing businesses to extend onto the street. So they had patios and, and restaurants had outdoor eating areas. So that started changing completely the characteristic of this, of this uh, the, the street. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying is that we need to, that's one of the challenges is, is we know what we need to do, but how do we convince people that are just used to being in a certain mode, how do we convince them that this is actually a very healthy, uh, positive, rich way of living? Uh, so that's one of the, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we have. With that challenge, mm -hmm. um, what could be some possible ways mm -hmm. or approaches mm -hmm. to deal with them? Like, what do you see as some, what, are, what do you see as kind of the most promising Mm -hmm. uh, directions that we can go, and you know, especially from the planning. I, you know, I, I really appreciate the work that the planner, especially you know, master planners, mm -hmm. are doing because, in especially for cities, when the art, when the master plan is done, mm -hmm. and all the other designs actually they are becoming like band aid. Yes. However, the master plan is so fundamental. So, from a master planning point of view, what do you see as some fundamental strategies mm -hmm. uh, that we can use mm -hmm. uh, to guide our our design. From, from, our pers from our WGI's perspective and my perspective, um, designing a climate responsive 
uh, city does a lot of things for you. So the one thing it does is, an, an obvious one, is it allows you to control the microclimate within the city. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're, you're, you're going to create optimal microclimates everywhere. That's very difficult to do. But it does mean that you can identify certain areas that are, say, primary pedestrian walkways. And you can make sure that the massing, uh, that the way the street is oriented, the grid, and even down to the small elements, such as landscaping, all work in unison to create an environment which is very inviting. Mm -hmm. So this, this really helps not only the health of the population, but even creates a lot of economic vibrancy. And this was shown in several studies uh, where they looked at pedestrianized streets versus non-pedestrianized. And they actually found that the stores were doing much better in the pedestrianized streets versus the non-pedestrianized. So there, there's a whole host of, of, of benefits. Mm -hmm. But even looking at climate change, uh, sorry, not climate, uh, climate responsive uh, master planning, what you start doing is uh, you start lowering your energy. Mm -hmm. uh, you start reducing things like heat island. Uh, you start uh, improving the air quality uh, for people. Um, you, you, you tackle things like right to light. Uh, you tackle things like overshadowing. Uh, so there's a whole host of things that it's like a thread. You, you pull on one and things start to roll out uh, just by doing this. The other interesting thing about th rethinking the way we live and, and the way we move in a city is you start to think about right of ways in a city. And when you start to think about reduced traffic in those right of ways, or very specific in certain ones, not everywhere, but you suddenly start to reclaim a lot of this public space and potentially you start to reclaim that space for real estate. Mm -hmm. And if you start doing that, then also that has a, a market driver where it starts to reduce your, your cost effectively because you can... You know, build more effectively. So there's there's definitely a tipping point where we start to rethink how we live in cities and how we move around cities where and how we design to make them more climate responsive uh, that in essence it, it it sort of hits, it touches all these points mm -hmm. and starts to create a, a much more inviting place to be. Yes, in the, from a plan or design, a designing point of view, you can see that we are we're trying to look at all these built environment. You know, we can we can fine tune or improve our design and our planning. Mm -hmm. And I remember earlier you mentioned uh, changing people's perception and behavior. Mm -hmm. I think that's you know the other side. Kind of while we are thinking about all this right, uh, mm -hmm. this infrastructure, but in the end, it's really going to be people's choices Absolutely. and their behavior. So how do you see in the kind of, you know the strategy you just talked about? Mm -hmm. How do those strategies interact with human demand and human behavior? Mm -hmm. Do you see any barrier or what would be the, a very good way to reach out mm -hmm. and change mm -hmm. the perception? It's interesting because whenever I ask people and I'm in a conversation, I say, you know, out of all the places you've been, where have you liked walking outside the most? And invariably, there's, there's always a theme that sort of starts to pop out. One, generally people talk about Europe and about, you know, having these small streets and, and sort of these little convoluted pathways, uh, these plazas um, where you have cafes spilling out. That's one thing. And the other thing is uh, r really trying to create what happens with this kind of master plan or this kind of design, um, whether it's, it's um, uh, on purpose or not, <laughs> uh, what happens is that you actually are creating very controlled climate zones because these tight streets maybe reduce your solar load, which is good in the summer mm -hmm. on people, but potentially they also reduce your wind. So in, in, in the colder days, you don't feel that wind through there. Mm -hmm. uh, so. What I'm seeing is that if you create, a, uh, if you take care of people's thermal comfort to some extent, uh, then that will mean that people are a lot more accepting of these spaces. Mm -hmm. And that is, for me, a, a sort of a fundamental way of getting people outdoors.
and out of the buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, so because ultimately public space is 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 there for everyone's enjoyment and why not maximize its usage effectively and that's you mentioned sidewalk labs and the work we're doing on Toronto Portland and and that is a primary pillar of the work is how do we get people outside how do we make the outside their living room because ultimate for as much of the year as possible i know we're not going to do it at in the depth of winter at 3 a.m. <laughs> it's, no. it's not going to happen but potentially we can buy or get some more time in the spring and fall. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that can be a significant benefit to people uh, and businesses in, in, in the city. With all these very good vision and the pictures, you know, we, we have painted. And of course, uh, a natural question will be, how do we get there? How can we get those things done? And then we need tools. And I think, of course, you know, one important tool you are using, which mm-hmm. is, you know, this computational tool, yeah. which I... I'm definitely a, a strong advocator of that. So let's now kind of dive a little bit deeper mm-hmm. into the methodology and the tools. So why mm-hmm. computational? So I guess that for me, um, before we get to that, I think an important feature is stakeholders. You have to get the stakeholders to buy into your approach. <laughs> you are really a, a system engineer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't get... The stakeholders to buy in and that means everyone from city hall to the designer to to the master planner if if the team is not buying into what you're doing Mm -hmm. uh you can simulate forever and it doesn't matter it won't it won't impact it so that's that's the key thing so i've been fortunate to be working in projects where the stakeholders are fully fully involved fully engaged so the role is uh, at RWGI, we have computational resources at our disposal uh, from a, for a variety of platforms, approaches, etc. We also have wind tunnels uh, that allow us to be potentially more quantitatively accurate uh, when we need to be. Uh, so the first key is to really understand what tool to leverage and when. The reason I love computational tools is that you can leverage that kind of tool very early in the design process. And we are strong advocates of when the design team sits down at a table, that first design charrette, and they start literally drawing out the plan. And generally it's it's super blocks and it's uh, very blocky massing. There's no form to it, nothing there. Mm -hmm. That's when, as soon as they're done that, their first concept, Let's talk about it. And potentially the first step is not simulating. Potentially the first step is just saying, look, based on the climate, we, we, we always do a deep dive into the climate. Mm-hmm. Based on the climate, this is what, from our experience, this is what you're seeing. But very quickly you want to transition into starting to simulate. And the reason is that there's stuff that it's easier to communicate uh, when you have the results in front of you. Um, the other thing is it starts a process and it starts a process that allows the design team to get comfortable with the value that these tools can give you. Um, the risk is that, uh, we, the design team also gets a perception that what you're giving them is extremely accurate. (laughs) That's not the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. The purpose of it is to see an incremental change and improvement in the design process. And so when we start with design A, we say, we don't like this. Here, here, and here, here. This is a problem. Let's change it. Let's do these things. Mm -hmm. Re-simulate. This is the incremental change. Great. (laughs) We've, you know, it's, this is where we want to be. And so... This is concept design. And then the team starts to refine the massing. The buildings start to take a bit more shape. Uh, the streets get a little bit more defined. Mm-hmm. We re-simulate using computational tools. We start to choose metrics. So the metric could be what's thermal comfort like? What is our energy consumption for these buildings? What are wind comfort uh, conditions? Mm-hmm. Um, what is air quality? What's our air quality uh, mm-hmm. in the city? Uh, what's our noise? 
uh, environmental noise signature uh-huh. of the city. Um, what's our daylighting potential look like? Mm-hmm. Is there glare? So all these things are things we can test along the process. And the idea is that you give the design team and the end client a measure of safety in that when they finish the design, they're confident that their design is has the lowest risk potential mm-hmm. and that nothing catastrophic will come out in the future. So uh-huh. that's really the, the end goal, um, uh, to, to get the design team to a point where they're really happy uh, with, with, with the design. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are the major difficulties in applying computational and what in computational method and do you see a limit mm-hmm. of computational method mm-hmm. in achieving what you wanted sure. to do? I don't, yeah, I, I think, I mean, the, the, the computational challenges and speaking specifically computational fluid dynamics, um, you know, some of the challenges have been challenges for years and years. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's taking this model that is in a certain state, mm-hmm. uh, you know, meshing it, getting it set up, running it, etc. Um, you know, that, that's, of course, just the, the systemic issues that you have with that. I think one of the, the, the biggest risks, though, is um, not understanding what you're doing. Uh, and, and we see this a, a bit where you have maybe these black box tools where people are just throwing things in and then the tool spits out something <laughs> and you're like, ah, you know, and, and then there's a, an, a significant amount of trust in those results. And at RWGI, we've gone to quite a bit of effort to understand mm-hmm. when we do some kind of environmental modeling like this, what are its limitations, what can we count on, and what can we not count on. An example, um, when we do a steady state simulation over a city, which is probably one of the most basic ones, that basic kind of simulations that we do, we like it because it's fast. And we could do multiple wind directions, m- speeds if you want, multiple configurations very quickly. But we could never really use that or shouldn't be using that for things like defining natural ventilation within a building. Or we shouldn't be using it for structural load analysis on a building. That's right. um, because we understand that really the gold standard for that is wind tunnels. Maybe and I think computational fluid dynamics will get there. It, I don't think it's there in, in the industrial world, mm-hmm. uh, in industrial sector yet, but it will get there. I'm very bullish on computational methods. I think, it, it, you know, I, I, what, what we've seen, and I'll, again, I'll give you an example. At OWDI, probably five years ago, 10 years ago, to do a master planning project, it would take us about four weeks, four to five weeks to simulate, not even, you know, just to simulate the work. We're doing that in half the time now, uh, so, or even less. So what that means is that increase in computational power, increase in the automation, autom- automation of, c- of certain steps in the process mm-hmm. have really allowed us, again, that idea of leveraging things very early on. And for me, the important thing is, I would love to see this, is almost a real-time following of what the design team is doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're, I think we're very close to getting there. The one barrier that I see is computational cost because we've seen a, a drop in that, of course, mm-hmm. but we've also seen an increase of what's demanded. So we, we, we are acquiring much larger master plans, much more intricate designs, uh, larger mesh, num- mesh counts, uh, higher density meshes, more physics, all these things also drive up the cost. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a maybe an inflection point there somewhere where you know we're being limited a little bit by what the what we're able to leverage in terms of resources to study a certain project. Um, so that's that's I think for me the big limiter right now uh, is how do we leap over that? Yeah, I think one thing, uh, especially kind of. Uh, in my own research, actually, we also use computational fluid dynamics. Mm-hmm. I think uh, CFD is very good at kind of, it's kind of at a micro scale. Mm-hmm. We can simulate all the details, yes. right? Exactly. Um, if we have one building or one room, 
and I think CFD will work perfectly. Right. Right. But I think you know, as a master planner, mm. you're actually looking at the whole community. Yes. A neighborhood. Yes. So how did you? Of course, you can always okay. You safety just one by one. Thing. However, there are bundle conditions. All these things are going to be connected. How? Yes. What? What's your view of going from this kind of microscopic, micro scale mm -hmm. safety simulation mm -hmm. to say a block scale or even mm -hmm. a city scale? Right. Especially, for example, uh, your work with sidewalk labs mm -hmm. that you know you, you look at this you know waterfront. Yes. Right. There are of course there is going to be air coming from the water surface right and then you have all streets or transportation and you are going to have buildings yes so i think ideally if we have one integrated computational model mm -hmm. that incorporate everything yeah right oh, you're so, talking about shangri-la <laughs> however however like kind of in reality it might be too difficult how it's a multi-scale mm -hmm. right also kind of multi-dimensional thing how you know as a master planner mm -hmm. how how do you kind of decompose mm. all of these things from a system level to the component level and mm. in the end integrate from the component level to the system level to support your planning decision making. Right, that's a good question. So it, it, I guess the one positive is that during the master planning process, there is a, there's a very clear level of granularity and advancement of level of granularity as you go down the process. So the, as I said, the first step is to create these blocks. You don't really know what the buildings are going to look like. You don't know where the entrances are. You don't know what the glazing looks like. You don't know any of these details uh, until very much further down the line. So the simulation that, the types of simulations that you employ there, yeah. you're probably looking down, your simulation might be, your domain might be two to three kilometers by two to three kilometers. Uh, so it's a pretty large area where you have to include, obviously, your, your master planning, but you also have to include the surrounding buildings to a certain point. But then you're probably resolving down to the meter level. So mm -hmm. it's unrealistic to think at this point that you would be able to understand what the results are here and then two meters down over there, you have a higher level of confidence that you have a completely different result. And, and it's, it's, it's very accurate within two meters. Mm -hmm. It isn't. The, the whole point of it being is that we really just want to understand in a bulk way almost uh, how the buildings and the massing are interacting with the climate. So we're not at this point really too keen. We don't, don't need to really understand what the interface between the building and the outside is. Mm -hmm. As you go down the process, and potentially when when the building designer gets involved, and then they start thinking about the building itself and the building systems and where the entrances are and, and what the glaze, yeah, then you start to see a very interesting interface. Where, That's true. Yeah. yeah. So at that point, you're you know, for example, the designer says, you know, I'd love to have natural ventilation <laughs> in this building, and right off the bat. I just said a moment ago, you can't use steady state simulations to look at natural ventilation, but you can look at it and say your potential for your building is not good or it's good uh, or it's good only if you have a cross flow ventilation between the south and the north facades, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the building designer says, okay, that's good enough. Let's think about how we can create a building like that. But at some point, they might say, what's the impact? How, how much natural ventilation can I count on? At that point, you're in a different tool. So you either have to understand the inter that interface and how the outside wind and pressurization on your building impacts this internal model of your building. And the internal model could be an energy model uh, with natural ventilation capability, so a flow network capability. Mm -hmm. but there's a lot of other physics that are going into the building, uh, things like your energy systems, people's behavior, uh, what you expect the internal workings of the building to be that you wouldn't simulate in, in the whole domain at this point. Mm -hmm. So for example, I mean, when we simulate a city, we'll simulate N wind directions, 10 wind directions, six wind directions, whatever we feel is, is appropriate. 
but we don't necessarily we won't simulate different temperature conditions for example so what that means is that the the, the, the interface we, we, we wouldn't really be able to simulate every hour of the year inside the building using the full simulation we could use these simpler energy models to do that or we could do an internal CFD model which simulates a specific temperature condition and specific wind condition and we can play with that mm -hmm. so it's it's definitely at this point we we don't see this monolithic tool that gives us absolutely everything what we see is a careful decision of what we're using to simulate and how do we connect between the interfaces mm -hmm. um, when i was doing my phd my phd is in fluid structure interaction and so the one thing was we didn't have one tool to do the structure and the fluid, the fluid. we literally had it would simulate the fluid and at the same time it would simulate the structure and you'd have this interface and you'd communicate between the two uh, and you'd try to reduce energy loss things like that but it, in essence you would pick the tools that are best for the job and then you interface the two so um, I don't think we we're not driving to this one size fits all type of model at RWDI we're we're picking and choosing our tools so that we can best provide that value uh, to the client. I think that's a very kind of reasonable yeah. uh, description. I think, yeah. you know, kind of the, the ideal situation mm -hmm. meeting with the reality, yeah. right? So, yeah. so do you want to talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the project that you're working on now with uh, Sidewalk Labs? Sure. Kind of, because you know, I think that project got a lot of uh, news coverage. Yes. Uh, so It's a very interesting project. Um, so we're working in, in the group that's it's nominally called the Outdoor Comfort Group. Uh, and the, the group is, is cons consists of RWGI and uh, a, design, uh, a design and architecture studio out of Toronto called Partisans. So Sidewalk Labs came to us with a challenge, and the challenge was twofold. Uh, one is how do we define outdoor comfort? And if we understand that outdoor comfort drives a lot of the, the let's call it the... Um, the, the, the city life or, or uh, it really defines how people use a city, uh, then how can we, A, model the outdoor comfort in, in, a, in, in sort of a city, and then B, how do we uh, manipulate it? How do we start to change it? And how do we maximize the amount of time that people can be outside? So... What we started doing is our design process and what, what Partisans and, 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 and RWI started to do was look at, for example, different typologies. So you have the open space, the building edge, the urban canyon, so different typologies that we expect. Uh, and then also looking at the different climate types that we expect in Toronto and responding to that with a prototype design. And the designs that came out were very interesting. Uh, one of them was um, maybe the one that, that has seen most traction is what we call the, the raincoat. Mm -hmm. And the raincoat is, in, in essence, a second skin to your building. Uh, so we all know that we hit a building, uh, we have this very sharp interface between the inside conditions in a building and the outside conditions in a building. But what if we create another layer to it, sort of an intermediate layer, mm -hmm. where conditions are not really internal, and they're not really external, but they feel kind of like you're outdoors. And the advantage is that from comfort research, people are actually much more forgiving of temperature, humidity, and so forth mm -hmm. if they feel like they're outside. Because when you're in a park, you know, temperatures can be much lower than, for example, if you're inside a, an office, because you expect temperatures to be controlled in an office. You're not outdoors. Right. So uh, in essence, what the concept is that the skin can provide a space where you can have seating areas, you can have playgrounds, you can have whatever you des your dreams <laughs> you can dream up. Uh, but it'll allow us to, to some extent, passively control the climate 
And maybe you won't be sitting there at 3 a.m. in the winter, mm -hmm. but for a good chunk of the year, you can use that space. The cap, this raincoat is also adaptable, right? Oh, that's amazing. So the idea would be, and I mean, you can think about different levels of adaptability. So one is just seasonal adaptability. So maybe someone in the summer goes and takes off panels and allows a lot more natural ventilation in the summer uh, and then puts them back when it's colder. Uh, or you can have uh, you know, panels with a certain kind of solar heat gain coefficient uh, in the summer, but then pull them off for a different one in the winter. Uh, or, or maybe it's a lot more responsive. Maybe you have this uh, uh, thermochromic material that as the temperature drops, it actually lightens up and allows more sun in. So the idea is to create this toolkit that designers can then look at and say, you know what, for my site on the south side of my building, uh, it is quite exposed to winds, but it would be a great place to put an outdoor seating area, you know, have some kind of protected zone. What can I use, uh, what can I use to get there? And then they go to this toolkit and they say, out of all of them, this is the system that I would like with these features. And they can easily include it uh, in, into their design. So that's really the whole purpose of this outdoor comfort system uh, is really matching up um, what we're simulating from a, from a larger perspective because we're also doing the simulations over Keyside and the Portlands uh, from a thermal comfort perspective. How does that match up to what we require from an outdoor comfort perspective? Um, so it's a very interesting approach because it becomes almost like a having this toolkit, a, a box of tools that you can just apply to your design, uh, having some measure of confidence that we've studied this toolkit and we know how it performs. Mm -hmm. So you already right from the bat, from the, from the get go, you kind of know what you can apply to, to where, uh, and then uh, the other thing is that there's a, a certain sense of community to it because one of the thoughts are, well, let's say you have uh, another system. Another system we were doing is, is the lantern, uh, the lanterns, which are, is in essence, they look like this water bottle, effectively, maybe. And maybe it goes up and down, so it retracts and, and expands. But maybe it's a great wind blocker if you create a forest of them. So let's say you're a member of the community and you want to create uh, a concert venue or you want to have a little outdoor meeting space but it's a bit windy that day. Well, you can maybe ask to grab some of these lanterns and to create an essentially a wind blocker. And maybe they move there autonomously or maybe they're moved there uh, by, by helpers. But the idea is that suddenly you're starting to democratize outdoor comfort to, to some extent and allowing the community to use these systems uh, in sort of a looser fashion. And that opens it up to, to a lot more possibilities. Uh, right, because it's 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 suddenly you no longer have the centralized system which has to organize everything. Mm -hmm. Community can take over. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So that's beautiful. That yeah. you know, it, it's a very good kind of system design. Yeah. So so now, uh, you know, I'm I'm thinking about so basically, you know, Cornell System Program. Mm -hmm. You know, we run a Master of Engineering, which is a professional degree program, mm -hmm. and also uh, about three years ago we started our PhD program mm -hmm. in systems. So even though you know, it's in system engineer, however, uh, please note this small kind of thing is that actually the PhD, the official name of the PhD program is actually called PhD in systems. Mm. It's not PhD in system engineer. Mm -hmm. We dropped the word engineer because okay. we realize, look at you know the city work you are working right. on. It's a lot of time. It's not just engineer. It's kind of you know dealing yeah. with stakeholders yeah. and humans. Yeah. So. Now, if you think back in, at the time when you were doing your PhD thesis, mm -hmm. uh, like a kind of this fluid dynamics mm -hmm. or the computer thing versus the work you are doing now, mm -hmm. there, there's so much difference and the change. Huge, huge. So what are, you know, how did you evolve mm -hmm. from like a very concentrated, focused mm -hmm. in kind of PhD researcher, like mm -hmm. you're working on that, and versus now this mm -hmm. must planner and how has your view and how has your approach changed? I mean, I want to see the del delta differences so that mm -hmm. my major goal is that what would you say to our 
PhD mm -hmm. and a master student in systems. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, because now you from your successful career, of course, you started as exactly like a PhD in a in a focused area. Mm -hmm. Now you are doing the real the system work. Mm -hmm. uh, what tips would you tell them and uh, what what kind of life mm -hmm. uh, life advice mm -hmm. uh, that you would like to offer? I, I would say seek difference. Seek, ver seek variability because um, when I was doing my PhD, uh, the work was, as you said, very focused, um, very technical. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, but I started to have a little bit, uh, this, the specifics of my, my work initially, very early on, was to try to mimic fish motion, so uh, fish propulsion. Mm -hmm. And I started being, I started having access to biology, uh, fish biology, and, and sort of starting to access people in the biology department uh, mm -hmm. and in the um, marine biology department. Uh, and that was sort of an interesting, the, the, the language is different. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so the, the language is different. So for one thing, it, it, it made me think about how do I communicate these complex technical challenges and these complex technical issues mm -hmm. to someone that is very intelligent, but has no idea <laughs> of, what, of what I'm doing in, in terms of, so, because I need to extract information from them and I need to extract the right information from them. So I need to, to some point, I need to explain what I'm doing to them. Mm -hmm. So that was a first eye opener. The other one is that working with RWGI, it's, I've been very fortunate to work with designers and architects and a lot of them come from sort of a more arts background so sort of a, you know like a humanities background almost mm -hmm. some are very technical but but a lot of them come from that side uh, and it's been really eye-opening because the whole thought about it is the whole thought process is really more about ultimately human beings and how we experience cities. So as engineers, we like to think about energy reductions and, you know, and like, you know, how do we reduce wind and like, you know, like technical elements and things like that. Uh -huh. But for example, <laughs> thermal comfort has a very, has a huge psychological component. So understanding what the limitations are, you can, you can create a, a beautiful outdoor environment mm -hmm. but if that outdoor environment's in a parking lot no one's going to be there <laughs> so it's that concept of the psychological adaptation of people to these spaces uh, is maybe for me has been very eye-opening uh, and how the architectural mind and designer works through the problem uh, is has been really amazing so when I when I when I say seek variety I mean seek out Conferences, proactively. proactively seek out conferences, seek out people, go talk to people that have nothing to do <laughs> or very little to do with the specific technical issues that you're having, mm -hmm. but maybe have a broader view or, or have an understanding of other fundamental things that could impact your problem because that will give you a better understanding of how your work can apply to the real world. That's a great advice. I think it's really, especially even if you look at a lot of like human discoveries, kind of innovation in a lot of it's really kind of some methods that were used in one discipline when they're applied to another discipline yeah. that could cause a, you know, a revolution in another Absolutely. area. Absolutely. Yeah. We had one researcher um, when I was doing my, master, my PhD, he was working on Roman aqueducts. <laughs> And uh, he wanted to understand the physics of a certain aqueduct in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we actually helped him look at the problem and actually simulate some of the things in CFD. And it was, it was very interesting because, um, you know, he, he, he had no real understanding of, of what, you what, what CFD is. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, just going through that process, trying to understand what he's looking at, and really defining the problem and understanding how we can drive to, to a sa an, an answer, in essence. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, that's a good example of that, where you have these very 
totally different purposes uh, or to- totally different uh, end and goals like coming together uh, and, and studying a very real world case uh, and uh, so that kind of thing is is I think is a huge bit I see yeah. I think that's great I think we're probably running out of the time yeah. and uh, so uh, I think that's great thank you yeah thank you very much thank you. <laughs> yes yeah.